Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Alexandra Campbell. I'm the executive director for the Reston Museum. And our mission is to preserve the past, inform the present, and influence the future of Reston through programs such as tonight's. Uh, before we get started, I do want to mention a few things. Uh, we will be recording tonight's presentation, and I want to thank Preston Community Center, who supports our programs and has made tonight's presentation possible. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. And today we're going to be exploring Reston and mid-century modern living, particularly looking at uh, early Reston homes, um, the architecture and interior design of early Reston homes. Uh, a little background on myself. Um, I've been with the museum for almost four years now. Uh, I grew up in Fairfax County, but I moved to Reston in 2018. And my background is in the history of decorative arts, which we will be talking a little bit about today. So we're going to start with some context talking about post World War II America. Uh, after the war, there was a building boom in the United States, uh, production of housing increased and new materials uh, such as plastic, plated metal, vinyl were becoming more widely available. For America generally, although we're going to see how Reston differs, uh, the post-war suburban home that was popular was a three-bedroom ranch. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, a split level was more common. And in the 1980s and 1990s, townhouses became increasingly popular. In Marion Russell Wright's 1950s book, A Guide to Easier Living, uh, the authors encouraged Americans to find their own style within the home, reject historic revival style furniture, and to live more informally. Uh, they stated um, that they wanted to create a more practical lifestyle for Americans. They recognized that housing in this post-World War era uh, was likely to be smaller and therefore uh, rooms needed to support multiple functions and um, also furniture needed to be more flexible as well. So they encouraged Americans to not be ashamed of living informally. Uh, so some key things they suggested was having movable furniture and also creating spaces uh, where distinct activities could take place. So for example, in the living room, they suggested having an area um, that was set up for study, a different area for eating, and another area for conversation. And the way that they recommended um, creating these spaces was using furniture as partitions. Uh, they also believe that the living room should have easy access to the kitchen, um, helping to live more informally. And one quote from the book says, true comfort here means that you can put a drink down anywhere without hunting for a coaster, a foot down anywhere, even on furniture without feeling guilty, and a cigarette fallen from an ashtray should not ruin a table, a rug, or a friendship. And you can see with the cover of their book here that um, they're putting this idea into practice of living informally. Uh, besides writing a book about uh, living uh, informally, the Wrights also designed furniture, so they were putting their ideas into practice that way as well. In terms of uh, furnishing the 1950s home, uh, the TV and the sofa definitely became a focal point of the home. Uh, furniture was advertised specifically uh, for uh, watching television. Families were taking on this idea of living more informally, uh, having dinner in the living room, uh, eating off of TV trays. Man-made fabrics such as vinyl uh, were advertised as being easier to take care of and that they would last longer. Um, so that became increasingly popular. 
uh, function was very important for furniture and having that dual purpose furniture um, was very prevalent, such as drop leaf tables, collapsible chairs and tables uh, to save space. Uh, families were often moving more often than before, on average every three to five years, so having LIDAR portable furniture was also desirable for these more mobile families. Uh, while the while many did embrace the rights idea of comfort and practical furniture and and purchase this uh, the new furniture with modern designs, traditional options were still popular and we're going to see how uh, some rest and homes incorporated both modern and traditional furniture in them. Uh, in particular, uh, Jackie Kennedy's 1962 televised uh, tour of the White House awakened a new interest in early American furniture. Uh, later in 1976 with the American Bicentennial, that would also encourage um, the in, uh, increase of people being interested in having early American furniture. Uh, in contrast, modern furniture um, was often cheaper than historical reproductions, and so that helped uh, modern furniture rise in popularity. Oh, it, with the 1960s uh, designs, uh, there was an increased use in materials such as plastic, aluminum, and molded plywood. Uh, bold, bright coloring, uh, wood paneling, and Scandinavian designs with their use of teak wood was also popular. And we'll see Scandinavian designs used uh, in rest and interiors as well. In looking at Fairfax County specifically, um, a 1960s community profile listed common items in Fairfax County households uh, to include a washing machine, freezer, air conditioning, telephone, television, uh, and one or two cars. Uh, these were all above the national average at the time. Uh, having colorful appliances, as seen here, was very common as well. Uh, as a part of our research for this presentation, uh, we reached out to the group Rest and Remember When, uh, asking about their memories of early rest and interiors. And colorful appliances was one of the recurring themes throughout the comments. So uh, if you're a part of that group and responded to our, our call for um, information about early rest in homes, thanks for participating in that. And it was really great to hear from everybody. Uh, how new suburban neighborhoods were designed also influenced uh, the look of interiors. Uh, here we have an image of Levittown, which is widely recognized as the first American suburb. Um, the the uh, model homes of Levittown were based off of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, designs, um, but we're going to see how Reston differed very much from uh, Levittown. And you can see here uh, with the, there's just rows upon rows of houses, everything kind of looks the same. And you can imagine that all of the families who lived here had to travel some distance probably to get to work, to school, uh, to any of the practical and recreational amenities that they wanted, such as the grocery store or parks and things like that. And so Reston took a very different approach. They didn't want to have a cookie cutter look. Uh, and Reston's planning really emphasized uh, communal space over private space and creating accessibility um, to amenities that people needed. Uh, one article from the time period that talks about Reston in particular says that in the frantic rush to provide houses during the post-war period, a sense of community was all but ignored. Uh, the planned community is one hopeful answer and the pioneers in cluster housing in Reston had faith that the planned community would work out. So now we're gonna turn our attention to talking more specifically about Reston. Uh, founder Robert E. Simon Jr. specifically collaborated with many different architects so that Reston would have a diverse look and offer different types of housing and options and styles. 
Uh, this also closely aligned with Ruston's founding principles of having housing for all, access to amenities, being able to live, work, and play within uh, this one community. Early homes of Ruston were built along Lake Anne and the golf course, and this interweaved the private and public and showcased Ruston's uh, amenities. Uh, many early uh, articles about Ruston describe it as a city in, a con in the country. Um, so setting the stage there. Uh, so Ruston homes often had public views, but architects did try to take into account uh, how to create more uh, private spaces. Uh, so on the right here, you can see this diagram. This is of Lake Ann Plaza. And when they were designing this, they were looking at uh, what the exterior view would be and the orientation of the interior and how that all worked together. So you'll see here, there are arrows pointing outward. So that uh, was to indicate that uh, the view was very outward focused and it makes sense. You want a view of the lake. And so that's what it's offering there. Whereas it's a bit hard to see, but everything here in this, uh, U shape here actually had a more interior focus, so that the arrow is actually looping around. Uh, so all of those interiors had a more uh, inward focus in terms of the layout of the housing. Uh, townhouses were also a pretty new concept uh, for suburban neighborhoods during this time. Uh, in an interview with uh, one of the master planners, William Conklin, he stated that um, the that they felt that the endless number of individual housing like Levittown was a bit boring and didn't create culture didn't create community. And so having this variety of housing, the townhouses, which are close together, brought people together very naturally and helped to create that early sense of community for Reston. When looking at uh, single family homes, uh, there were over 20 private builders who were involved with the creation of single family homes in Reston in the 1960s. Uh, here we just have two examples. On the left is an image of a single family home off of Lake Anne. And on the right is a, a home that was in the Hunters Woods area. Uh, with Hunters Woods in particular, uh, it was, uh, the area was promoted as having very tall trees and that uh, many of the single family homes were located on cul-de-sacs. And again, having with that, you have the houses a little bit closer together, although uh, Hunters Woods was um, designed to be low, low density. Uh, the separation of rooms in Reston was given positive feedback from the press. Um, so one article in particular uh, stated that Reston interiors had complete separation of function. Uh, so allowing the, for different activities to happen in different rooms. Uh, many homes, such as the townhouses designed by architect Clotilde Woodard Smith, uh, had modern technology. Um, built in and these were listed on the brochure such as what we have here so they talk about the kitchen having GE appliances central air um, also that the home had a frost-free refrigerator a separate dining area a laundry chute a carport and uh, baths with vanities uh, the Images on the left and right are early promotional materials for Reston. In the center there, we have images of artifacts from the time period. And so you can get a sense here that uh, the person who drew this was probably uh, pulling from uh, item, uh, looking at artifacts that they were seeing in, in real life to create these designs. And they were taking into account the modern aesthetic and imagining that Restonians would uh, take this design elements within their own home and showing how that looks here. 
Uh, next, we're going to look at the model homes of Ruston. Um, so model homes were in Hickory Cluster, which is featured here, uh, and Waterview Cluster. Uh, the model homes were designed uh, both to have a modern aesthetic, but also a traditional aesthetic. So we'll see the different, the contrast there. Um, the model homes were designed by J. Frederick uh, Lohman, who went by Fritz. Um, Lohman was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1922. Uh, he received design training from Brown University and the Rhode Island School of Design. After college, he went to California, where he worked as a set designer for Paramount Pictures. And later, he would go to New York as an assistant decorator, um, decorating department manager for James McCreary and Sons, and later would become an associate director of the Bertha Schaefer Art Gallery. In 1951, he established his own interior design firm in New York. Uh, starting in 1962, he started lending his design talents to both contract and residential interiors. So this is the time that he's helping out uh, in Reston, but uh, he was also involved in uh, New York City buildings such as the Wedgwood, Wedgwood House Lobby, the 55th Street Playhouse, uh, the Forum, and other buildings as well. And here we're going to see more interiors, but what we have here is a, a bedroom uh, that was one of the in the model home for uh, Goodman's Hickory Cluster. Uh, Rhoda Sandy was uh, another uh, person who was involved with uh, creating the model homes. Uh, she was an artist and had a gallery in New York City. Uh, she also conducted a successful business working with manufacturers to arrange products on real realtors tables. And so she's bringing that expertise here in the arrangement of all of the artwork in the model homes for Reston. Uh, we're going to start with looking at Waterview cluster uh, model homes. Uh, so we'll start with the more modern design. The furniture here came from uh, Herman Miller. Uh, Herman Miller and uh, one of their designers, George Nelson, uh, was instrumental in standardizing uh, furniture sizing as well as creating some of the first modular furniture. And so that's what they're incorporating into the model homes here in Reston. Uh, here we have a living room. Again, we have Herman Miller furniture being used, and we can see, as we were talking about earlier, that the furniture is arranged around the television here. Uh, the chair was designed by uh, Charles Eames, and you can see a color image of that on the left. Um, the wall system is Herman Miller. And then the books that were picked out for the model homes uh, came from the Francis Scott Key Bookshop, which was in Georgetown. Uh, it was operated by Mrs. Doris Thompson and Mrs. Martha Johnson. In the 1960s, the Washington Post would write about the bookshop, and they noted that the two largest categories of books uh, from this bookshop were children's books and mysteries. So that might have been some of the types of books that were displayed in the model homes. Here we have two more images of uh, Waterview cluster model homes. A uh, dining room and a bedroom. And again, here we're, this is um, Herman Miller furniture used in here. Uh, now we'll move on to the more traditional looking uh, model homes at Waterview Cluster. Uh, the furniture here came from uh, the Crayler, um, the Crayler Furniture Company. Um, and so you can see here, it's very different from the other images we were looking at. The furniture is a bit heavier and you can definitely see the influence of early American furniture in uh, the shape of the chairs, the cabriolet, the slipper foot, um, the dark wood, uh, very reminiscent of early American furniture. Uh, here we have, um, 
this is again uh, the traditional look. Uh, he, we have uh, Windsor style chairs being used. Uh, the picture on the right, it also came from uh, Rhoda Sandy, uh, but you can see here she's matching uh, even the artwork to the furniture as well. It looks very much like early American portraiture. Um, and uh, it's very hard to tell, but actually these two rooms um, were noted as having uh, cork flooring and uh, the furniture set was uh, referred to as the Cape Cod uh, set. Uh, here again, we have another uh, Crailer furnished um, Waterview cluster home uh, recreational area. Uh, here we have bedrooms. Um, so on the left is uh, a little boy's room. On the top right is uh, the guest bedroom. And on the bottom right is the master bedroom uh, utilizing the traditional style. So we have the four poster bed, uh, the desks in here, uh, the Windsor chair uh, style again. So incorporating that traditional style. Uh, next, we'll move on to the Hickory cluster model homes. Uh, so on the left here, we have um, a little boy's room. And on the right is a little girl's room. Uh, in particular, they're utilizing uh, a chair that was designed by Charles Eames of molded uh, plastic. Uh, we got a color image here at the top, so you can kind of see that material a little bit better. Uh, again, they're also using Herman Miller furniture in uh, Hickory Cluster townhouse or Hickory T Cluster model homes as well. Uh, this is an image of a Hickory Cluster uh, guest bedroom and how that might look. Uh, Hickory Cluster again, and on the left we have a living room, and on the right we have a dining room. Uh, this was the master bedroom um, on in the foreground. Uh, the chair there was known as a coconut chair and uh, had a metal base and vinyl upholstery. Uh, the next uh, couple slides, we'll look at uh, what was referred to as the Goodman uh, Burlington House designs. Uh, so on the right, we have a bedroom and on the left um, is a living area. Uh, so you can see here, it's sort of a, a mixture um, of new and old glass tabletops. It's a bit hard to see, but perhaps this couch is modular um, as well. Um, interestingly enough, too, um, the furniture or the bed specifically actually came from Hex, which was around until not too long ago. Uh, this was the Burlington House study. And so that <laughs> concludes our focus on the model homes. Uh, we didn't see any bathrooms, um, but we do know a little bit about uh, early uh, uh, bathroom design for Reston homes. I don't know if this image actually comes from a Reston home in particular, but it came from an article that talked about how uh, American Standard had been hired to create bathroom fixtures for early Reston homes. Um, American Standard was uh, located in Alexandria, so not too far away. And the article um, states that uh, plumbing, once a purely utilitarian feature, has now risen to new decorative heights, offering beauty of design and texture as well as practicality. Uh, so this was seen as, as very a very decorative sink, uh, which is interesting to think about 
when comparing and contrasting with today's furniture or uh, bathrooms. Uh, and so, as I said, we don't know if this specifically came from a rest and home, uh, but sort of my fun trivia fact of the day, I guess, um, is that uh, the staff bathroom actually at the Reston Museum has this exact sink in it. So um, likely, likely an original sink. So that's something um, they did in fact use, even if this is not a rest and home. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, and look at the interiors of Gulf Course Island, uh, which were designed by Louis Sauer. Um, so these are, are very dramatic designs. Uh, with uh, the brochure here, it describes the homes as having family sized kitchens that included a breakfast area, uh, that it had GE appliances, bedrooms with extra large closets. Uh, also, it emphasized the huge windows and the sun decks and patios, which um, gave a really good view of the golf course as well. Uh, so the interiors were very dramatic. Um, they were designed by Emily Molino um, and very much uh, emphasized and uh, used a modern, not only a modern aesthetic, but modern material, materials as well. So using nylon, uh, there was plywood wall paneling, laminates, um, acrylic fiber. So just using a lot of modern materials in the design. And you can see it's very bold and bright and colorful. This is a child's bedroom uh, in one of the model homes of Golf Course Island. Uh, so you can see here we've got a metal bed frame, uh, the floral print uh, and the bright colors definitely uh, have a 1960s aesthetic. Uh, and here another child's bedroom on the right and a dining room on the left. And we can see a lot of uh, very dramatic print, a lot of contrast in color and uh, bold use of color here. Uh, this was a living room. And so again, just really bright and colorful, fun. We got the windows looking outward, uh, contrast in, in the colors used here as well. And that animal print rug as well is just fabulous. Uh, we don't have um, actual photographs of the interior uh, here, but this is a brochure uh, for Wainwright cluster. Uh, so you can see what they were imagining for that particular cluster in terms of furnishings. Uh, and I would say going along with the more modern aesthetic. This is uh, an interior of a home on Lake Anne. Uh, it was designed by Kent Cooper and Associates. Uh, uh, the Rest in Times article that published these uh, photographs of the home said that the home was laid out to suit uh, the habits of its owners. So instead of having a large formal dining room or living room, excuse me, uh, there was a more intimate conversation area that had soft couches and a fireplace. Uh, downstairs, they had a large bar uh, and card tables, and there was also a study and a music room. Uh, the furniture that was used was actually um, very dark wood was used and kind of blocky furniture, uh, but the um, author of the article stated that they thought it went very well with the homeowners collection of art that they had acquired in Asia while they were in foreign service. And again, too, they talk about how the patio and the deck and the windows um, uh, allowed for a very good view of uh, the lake outside. Here's another uh, Lake Anne interior. Um, and it talks about how the article that this was published in discusses that uh, while it had really great views, there was still uh, a feeling of having privacy within the home. Um, and uh, 
the home was uh, furnished um, with uh, Japanese art and Turkish rugs that they felt also uh, coordinated very well with the lake setting. Uh, this was a townhouse uh, on Lake Anne, uh, and they the owners actually converted one into one of the bedrooms into a study, so fitting the house to their unique purpose. And they also used one of the rooms as a music room, which you can see here. Um, and this is a. Hunter's Woods home um, and the article that talks about this home in particular said that it featured a large kitchen family room with beam ceilings, a recreation room that had a fireplace, a space that could be used for a fifth bedroom, uh, and that the uh, lower level was unfinished. Um, it, it also had a double carport, air conditioning, and hand split cedar shake roof. Uh, so that was how this particular home was advertised. These are all interior views of uh, homes uh, of, of a home in the Hunters Woods area. Uh, and you can really see uh, the personal touches of the homeowners here and the choice of furniture uh, and artwork. Uh, you can see too, just like in the Lake Ann area, the exterior is taken into consideration the design. We have these large windows that look out into the wooded area uh, behind the house. Uh, unfortunately, the publications that we found these images in uh, did not specify where they were in Reston, but they were in fact in Reston. Uh, we have again the TV as a focal point here, uh, and on the right, the view of the outside is really emphasized. Uh, rest and homeowners could also easily uh, furnish their homes with modern furniture if that's what they chose to do. Uh, one of the first shops at Lake Ann was a Scandinavian furniture store called Gudrun. Um, it was operated by Mrs. Dunahoo. Uh, she sold teak furnishings, artwork, and gifts. Um, she did not sell kitchen items as that was not her cup of tea. So they couldn't go there for kitchen items, but if they wanted Scandinavian furniture or artwork, this was easily accessible to Restonians. Uh, so that wraps up our presentation for the evening. Uh, the majority of our pictures used today uh, came from our archival collection. We have over 3,000 artifacts in our collection. You can browse them online. I'll put the link in the chat in a moment, but you can see it here on the screen so you can browse and see what we have. Uh, we're also planning on in October to have uh, some of the images from tonight's presentation on display inside the museum. So if you'd like to see some of these up close and personal, stop by the museum in October. And thank you all for joining us. I hope you can join us for our upcoming events. Our next uh, program uh, will be a, hopefully a hybrid in-person and virtual program uh, with Reston Community Center on November 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, Shelly Masterin, who's on our board, has published a wonderful book on the brink of change, the geography of Fairfax County circa 1960. And so she will be presenting about her book. And then uh, in complement with tonight's program, we are very happy and excited that the Rest and Home Tour is back this year, which will be October 16th. Um, and so uh, we can uh, kind of compare and contrast the 1960s with all the wonderful renovations that uh, homeowners are doing today. So I hope you can join us for that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody. And I think uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions, but I think I'd, I'd like to start off just by asking everyone now that you've seen the images or perhaps um, 
uh, your memories of the 1960s, if anybody has any thoughts about uh, how homes of the 1960s compare with how we design homes today, if anybody wants to share. I think it's interesting a lot of the furniture that you see like in um, West Elm, it definitely um, mimics some of those um, furniture models that you showed us. You know, yeah. Models. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's still very popular. People and are- even uh, Crate and Barrel now is showing a lot of, um, this season showing a lot of the woven cane and you know some of the other natural materials that you showed. Yeah, we got a comment here that uh, don't miss the orange shag. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an interesting comment. I think I almost think it's more interesting the stuff that didn't you know, become popular, like the stuff that you can kind of look at and be like, yeah, maybe we leave that back in the 50s and 60s. But there is so many things in the furniture design and also just the way the spaces are laid out that it is completely contemporary and is still like things that, you know, are very much in style and are practical, just like they were 50, 60, 70 years ago. Absolutely, yeah. One thing that I noticed that's so different from then to now is the size of the rooms, the size of the closets, the size of the bathrooms. I mean, everything was so much smaller uh, in the 50s and 60s, today. you know, every room. And also Alex, I cannot believe it, but I could, when I saw you with that sink and the faucet, <laughs> I thought I have seen that before. <laughs> yes. I couldn't figure out before until you said it's in the museum yeah yeah so we got a, a real artifact back there <laughs> that's the only scene ever like that but oh goodness yeah yeah i i had the same thought when i stumbled across it. i was like huh this looks familiar and then when i figured it out it was quite fun so but i did i did think that was interesting that for us the closets do feel very small, but so many of the articles that I looked at uh, talked about how the early homes had these large closets. So it's all a frame a frame of reference, I guess. Before that, it was just wardrobes. Mm -hmm. I mean, just the idea of having separate closets was, you know, fairly revolutionary. We're probably around the turn of the century. Yeah, true. We just had armoires, right? Hang up your clothes on a, yeah, in a piece of furniture. You're right. Hey, Barbara, I think you're you're muted if you wanted to chime in. Sorry. Okay. That's I, all right. In a golf course island in the house that we moved in in 1968. And it may be an exception, but we have closets galore, big ones, big ones. And um, also some of the rooms are quite large. So it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, but the what intrigued me with one of the um, models that you showed was the color gold and avocado gold avocado and an orangey. And those were the colors. And my my uh, appliances were avocado green when I moved in here. So <laughs> anyway, I, some of the homes are small, but but compared to what is being built today with some of these houses, um, my house is, you know, has, has big rooms and, and storage has never been an issue. So it's kind of interesting. The exception, Louis Sauer was, did, did well at that part, I think. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have one more comment about the bathroom. I was also laughing about that because I know the museum bathroom well, but um, <laughs> I, I had access to some of um, Bob Simon's um, papers and documents as he was planning Reston. And there was one about how they wanted the the model homes to look. And one of his notes said they wanted sexy bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if those sinks apply, but and I'm not sure he succeeded, but that was a desire. I certainly aren't. <laughs> what, what is a sexy bathroom? I don't know. I have a friend, Alyssa Golf Course Island in the one of the models that you showed and she still has that same sink. <laughs> 
Oh, really? Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah. So, so do I in the downstairs one. Yes. Yeah, it's in a half bath. <laughs> yeah, I thought I was just like I don't know. Maybe the museum's the only one who has them left. Nope. So <laughs> nope, nope. They're still oh, alive and well in some of the houses over there. Oh, that's good. Right. That's right. And then we built cabinets in the half bath by the front door. Just built a little cabinet for it. But down all the way down in the lowest level, it's still there. Yes, it's mm -hmm. an. I guess it's an antique. <laughs> So, oh, fun. so I was curious about the Scandinavian furniture store at Lake Anne. Yeah. I had never heard about that before, but does anybody know, like, did they last for lo long or did they do well? Uh, I don't think it was there for very long, um, just based on the directories. I can't remember how far into the directories I got in terms of how long it was there. Um, I believe that it was located um, by, uh, or not by, but where the ice cream shop was, um, or is today, but closed, but <laughs> so right. that's where it was, yeah. Well, when we moved here in 72, there was Dockside over there across from what was the Safeway. And so that was a very interesting store because I, I, we moved here from Alexandria and we had a dockside right there on the Potomac River. And it was made me feel like I was home when I was able to walk down to Lake Ann and still shop at dockside. Because <laughs> that's about what we could afford <laughs> in the way of stuff for our, for our first apartment in Reston. Did Gudrun also sell uh, jewelry? There was a store at Lake Ann that sold very contemporary things. And so perhaps that was the same place. Uh, yeah, possibly. Uh, it just kind of listed it as um, that they sold gifts. So I would imagine jewelry would fall under that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and there was the Safeway at yeah. Lake Ann. It yes, wasn't there a was. very big one but it was there and it was the only shopping in Reston in 1972. If you, if you wanted to go to a giant grocery store, you went to the one at Tyson's Corner. Oh, wow. Right. London. Yeah. That's right. Or yeah. Sterling. Sterling. Yeah. Well, I, I never ventured that far west, but. <laughs> no, you went the other way. <laughs> yes, you went to Tyson's. That's right. Or Vienna because those were the other two places that had grocery stores and other kinds of shops that they didn't have in Herndon and they surely didn't have them in Reston. Yeah, that's right. Alex, I live in, um, I live in Waterview, so okay. I'm very interested in, um, I loved that you had more information about um, Clotilde Woodard Smith. And I, would, I was wondering if you could advise um, where I could find other information about her. I think she's fascinating. Yeah, um, I can uh, see if I can pull up some items. Um, I haven't been able to uh, get a hold of uh, there, a book, but there is a book about her, um, oh. but I have not been able to get a hold of it. I don't think it's in print anymore, and it's been rather difficult to track down. I don't know if they've made it available, but... Um, Sometime within the past year, uh, the National Building Museum uh, had, a, had a virtual program about her uh, where they had some different scholars um, talk about her. So uh, I can at least get the names of those people, I think, probably. I should still have that, um, but I don't know if they recorded and made that presentation available, but... Um, that was sort of one of the things they talked about is how um, influential she was and, and just impactful, but that uh, there are still a lot of things that aren't known about her that she hasn't talked about as much or even just like the pronunciation of her name is, is still up to debate and things like that. So mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a pretty good program. Um, she was yeah. really ahead of her time. I mean, she got her architecture degree in 1933. Yeah. Which is amazing. 
And good for Robert Simon for bringing her in to uh, design Reston. Yeah, I think she was the only um, architect who was a woman. She didn't like to be called a female architect. Right. She was an architect with a capital A, but I think she was the only woman that he invited in. Yeah, so. Yeah, so if you could just um, send me an email just as a reminder and I can. Sure. And that goes for it, any research yeah. request or anything. If you ever want to reach out to us, just email us and I will see what I have. Uh. Well, any any other thoughts or comments or questions? Yeah, Alex, I just want to say, I think you did a great job of research mm -hmm. all of this. Yes. Yeah. Thank no, you. I all, Great. all these images in our archive. So it, yeah, it was really fun to to find all of them and look at them and learn. Well, you you did a great job. Thank you. Great. Thank you very I'm much. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, let's see. And I think I'm spelling that wrong, but okay. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. And I hope you can join us for our next program. So thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy that. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.